Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name's Michael Hamblin. Um, for 25 years I was a uh, principal investigator at the Wellman Center for Further Medicine at uh, Mass General Hospital and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Recently retired from there and I'm now affiliated with the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, so I've been working on photo medicine, basically, use of all sorts of different kinds of light to treat all sorts of different diseases. What I'd like to tell you about today is what we call photobiomodulation, um, and specifically its use for hair regrowth, for growing hair in cases of alopecia. I'll tell you quite a lot about the, uh, the history and the mechanisms of photobiomodulation. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll go on to uh, cover some of the questions and ways that practitioners can select their patients to treat hair regrowth. OK, so... Uh, move this on. have some disclosures here. I've worked with companies that are in the uh, field of uh, hair regrowth, better by modulation, and some other companies. So I just listed some of the disclosures here. So the whole business of uh, Phototherapy, photomedicine, using light therapeutically, it's got a long history, actually. It started way back, well over 100 years ago. In fact, uh, Neil Spinson won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in uh, 1903, amazingly enough. And if you look here at his uh, Nobel lecture, you see that he personally had Neiman Pick disease, and he found that going out in the sunshine had big benefits for his health. So then he began to see if he could use phototherapy for other diseases, and he actually got the Nobel Prize for treating cutaneous tuberculosis. But he also was quite well known for treating smallpox. So quite a lot of benefits and quite a long time ago. Um, light therapy really sprang into uh, the popular um, belief uh, recognition after that. Um, in 1904, got the Nobel Prize, and that next few years, people really started to take uh, notice of how light could be therapeutic. Uh, there were several books published. Um, you can read them today. The PDFs of these books are available on the internet. And they also, because the electric light had just been recently invented, they began to look at electric light bars, and um, John Harvey Kellogg was a great proponent of these electric light bars. Um, and same Kellogg that invented Kellogg's cornflakes, actually. And there's, um, there's a center that has all the, uh, the models of the electric light bars that Kellogg proposed. Um, also, not only uh, electric lights, but sunshine. And uh, Auguste Rollier from Switzerland was the one who really started the idea of going out in the sun. And built a lot of clinics and sanatoriums in the Alps. Um, and lots of people with infections, and various diseases, um, uh, expose themselves to the sunshine in these clinics. Again, it was uh, very popular. And moving into the uh, latter part of the 20th century, in 1960, Ted Maiman built the first working laser, the uh, Ruby laser. Uh, he won the, the famous race to develop the first laser. And Paul McGuff treated a cancer uh, with a ruby laser, initially in animals, but also he treated humans with tumors with a ruby laser and managed to cure quite a few folks with cancer. Um, Andre Master 
developed an interest in medical uses of lasers. And in 1965, he got his own ruby laser. He attempted to repeat Paul McGuff's anti-tumor treatment. But because his laser was not particularly powerful, this didn't work. And then he tried to see if laser treatment could cause skin cancer in mice. And that didn't work either. You can't cause cancer with a laser. But he did, interestingly, observe increased hair growth because he had to shave the mice and rats to put the tumour in them. And when he shone the laser on the site he'd shaved, he noticed the hair grew back. He also uh, got better wound healing. So this really kicked off a, uh, an interest in what then was called low-level laser therapy. Um, problem about low-level laser therapy is nobody really knows what low-level means. Um, and now, because there were so many different terminology that were used to describe this, now the field has come with a consensus term of photobiomodulation. <clears throat> so that explains where this photobiomodulation came from. Um, and it really now has been widely used in, uh, to treat all kinds of diseases and conditions, from the uh, top of the head here with uh, hair regrowth, um, <clears throat> a lot in the brain, which is also in the head. I'll tell you a bit about the uh, <coughs> applications of the brain later on. Um, use it in the eyes for prevent blindness. A lot of uh, dentists like to use PBM for pain, for TMJ, um, use it to treat tinnitus, deafness, mucositis, um, a lot of things in the body. Um, some are superficial, some are quite deep, um, like lung inflammation with this uh, the modern COVID pandemic. People are using photobiomodulation to... Uh, increase the, uh, the benefits in the lung to stop the inflammation, the cytokine storm. Um, kidney failure is an interesting application. Uh, muscles, they respond very well to photobiomodulation. There are um, sexual function, infertility. You can mobilize stem cells. I'll tell you a little about stem cells. Tendons, um, wound healing. A lot of applications of photobiomodulation all over the body. A lot of devices have been used for PBM uh, because it was a lot of the, uh, the people that used PBM were laser therapists. A lot of the devices are lasers and you can see um, different kinds of lasers here. Some of them are quite powerful, some are not so powerful, but um, you know, you can get beneficial effects um, with a lot of different kinds of lasers. Um, recently, there's been a lot of interest in whole body photobiomodulation. So this uses LEDs rather than lasers. And LEDs can produce the type of light that was lasers, which is often red or near infrared. They're the popular wavelengths. You can combine the red and the near infrared together, um, things like the Novo Thor, um, various big panels that you can stand in front of. So there's a, a lot of these large devices that can irradiate pretty much the whole body, or at least a, a big area of the body. And they, these are generally quite powerful, so hundreds of watts of optical power of light, whereas lasers are generally lower power, um, can be measured in milliwatts or a few watts, but LEDs, because they cover such a large area, can be hundreds of watts. Because these LEDs are pretty harmless, you can use them as at-home devices, and there's a lot of these flexible um, <clears throat> arrays of LEDs. You can wrap around painful areas like the knees, um, there's handheld LEDs arrays that you can use. Um, so if you uh, go onto 
Amazon or Alibaba, you'll find dozens of these LED devices for home use. Again, usually red or near infrared. There's LED face masks because um, fine lines and wrinkles and skin rejuvenation again is a, a, a popular um, application because people are prepared to spend money on their appearance. Um, so one of the reasons that people use red or near infrared is that are these the wavelengths that penetrate into tissue. And here you can see the so-called tissue optical window, which um, means that the chromophores that absorb the light and scatter the light have a window in the red and near infrared region between about 600 to uh, 1200 nanometers where the light penetrates tissue quite well. So you can shine it on the surface and it will go deeply into the tissue. So the mechanisms. Um, everybody agrees that one of the main mechanisms is the mitochondria. And as you probably know, there are uh, four complexes plus ATP synthase in the mitochondria and the light probably absorbed by quite a few of these complexes because they all have so-called cytochromes which are molecules that absorb light. Don't forget the light has to be absorbed by a chromophore in order to have any biological effect. And complex four is cytochrome C oxidase so this is um, one of the uh, principal chromophores, but some of the other mitochondrial complexes and ATP synthase may also be involved in the mechanism. But the thing to remember is the mitochondria are the main players mechanistically. Um, so one popular hypothesis is that cytochrome C oxidase, which is unit four, as you saw on the last slide, can have this nitric oxide um, which inhibits respiration and the light could displace the nitric oxide thus allowing oxygen to return and respiration to increase and ATP increase. So basically the net result of this PBM on the uh, mitochondria is to get more ATP, more oxygen consumed, more respiration and generally increase the energy levels of the cells. Um, you get a lot of signaling taking place from these things that happen in the mitochondria. There's the mitochondria, you get the ATP, you get cyclic AMP, June FOS is the AP1 heterodimeric transcription factor, but you get a little burst of reactive oxygen species which can activate protein kinase D, degrade I kappa B, and allow NF kappa B to go to the nucleus. So these two are pleiotropic transcription factors that affect a whole host of things that happens in cells. Um, Anti-apoptosis, pro-survival, increases proliferation, cell migration, you get more extracellular matrix deposition and you get a lot of growth factors. So that generally stimulates the cells, increases wound healing and increases a lot of beneficial processes. There's also another interesting signaling pathway which has only recently um, become, you know, taken in account of which are these heat and light gated TRP ion channels and the wavelengths that activate these are slightly different from the red near infrared that activates the mitochondria. So blue and green uh, 980 which is a, a longer uh, near infrared wavelength they can produce conformational changes in these light sensitive ion channels and that allows calcium to move around inside the cell, to go into the cell, to go from the mitochondria into the cytoplasm. So you get a lot of calcium changes, which um, again stimulates a lot of cell uh, processes. Okay, so
The last mechanistic uh, slide I want to show is this idea of interfacial water. So most people think that water doesn't absorb light very well, but this nanostructured water can absorb light and changes the viscosity of the water. That allows this last part of the mitochondria ATP synthase, which is a molecular rotor, to whiz around faster. So again, you get more ATP because you've uh, activated the uh, interfacial water and ATP synthase. So because you trigger the mitochondria, you get more respiration, which means more oxidative phosphorylation. This triggering the mitochondrial switch has two major consequences. One is you activate stem cells because stem cells in their hypoxic niche carry out glycolysis. When the mitochondria are activated, they need oxygen, so they have to leave their niche in search of oxygen, and it activates proliferation and differentiation programs. So basically it mobilizes stem cells to do what they're meant to do, basically. So also explains why photobiomodulation is anti-inflammatory. So uh, because the macrophages with the M1 phenotype are pro-inflammatory, they also carry out glycolysis. When oxidative phosphorylation is activated, they switch to the M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. And these are anti-inflammatory, but also they can phagocytose stuff, so they can get rid of nasty things. So this triggering the mitochondrial switch is actually quite important. There's also uh, recently been discovered that blood contains circulating cell-free respiratory competent mitochondria. And if you look here, there's uh, a new bl blood component revealed. Um, blood is thought to be well known, contains elements that have been undetectable until now, which are these cell-free mitochondria. So that means that you can have a systemic effect of photobiomodulation. If it's absorbed by blood, then these mitochondria can carry the effects of the PBM around the body. So this explains why you get action at a distance, so to speak, in several uh, medical applications. So one thing that people are quite interested in is this so-called biphasic dose response, and, or hormesis, the Arndt-Schultz curve, because the, the reason they're interested in, they worry about whether you can give too much light. Um, and the idea about this biphasic dose response, you increase the dose, the effect goes up, it reaches a maximum, and if you keep increasing the effect, the light, the dose disappears. So there is an optimum amount of light. Um, one reason for this is the ROS I told you about. So oxidative stress is a matter of dose and duration. You need a little bit of ROS to give you beneficial signaling, but if you get too much ROS, <coughs> it can actually be damaging. So this is one explanation for this biphasic dose response. There's a lot of sensors in the body for these ROS, so it's well known now that ROS does a lot of signaling, a lot of beneficial effects, as well as the well-known damaging effects of oxidative stress. So the idea is a small amount of ROS is beneficial, but a lot, especially drawn out over a long time, which is chronic oxidative stress, is actually detrimental. Um, we've shown this in several experimental papers. So this was looking at uh, mouse primary cortical neurons. And you can see here there is a nice um, biphasic dose response curve here. And also you can't see too well here the calcium. Um, 
with the ROS, you get a biphasic dose response, but you give a lot of light and you get a second peak. So this is the too much ROS that can be damaging. Um, this was a study showing it happened in vivo, looking at wound healing in mice. And again, you see a nice biphasic dose response, whereas if you give a lot of light, like 50 times the first dose, you actually can inhibit wound healing a little bit. So this bolsters the idea that you can actually give too much light. I mean, I have to say that in humans, it's been difficult to demonstrate um, the detrimental effects of giving too much light. But I think we all agree that even in humans, there is an optimum amount of light. So another question a lot of people ask, do you need a laser? Um, coherent, monochromatic, highly collimated, can you use LEDs? And I'm convinced that you can use LEDs, but a lot of people think that lasers work better and one theory is this idea of laser speckles. So uh, because the laser light is coherent, spatially coherent, it can interfere when it reflects off a rough surface and you get this speckle pattern. And the idea is that the size of these speckles is about the same size as a mitochondria about half a micron. So it's possible that these speckles could stimulate the mitochondria better than non-coherent LED light. But, you know, despite a lot of research, this has not been categorically proven yet. Um, there's a lot of uh, different applications, as I said before, of photobiomodulation, but you can sort of rationalize the whole range of these applications when you understand the mechanisms. Um, I said that, you know, my lab over the years has done a lot of studies in the brain. I'm not going to go into detail about the brain studies because this is a talk on hair, even though they're both on the head. Um, but it really is starting to take off um, very widely for disorders of the brain because of a multiple of cellular and molecular mechanisms, which I've shown some of them here. Um, these are some of the uh, brain disorders that people are treating. So a lot of traumatic brain disorders, a stroke, a head injury, global ischemia after a heart attack, birth trauma, even people in a coma, um, neurodevelopmental disorders, autism, ADHD, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, CTE, even Huntington's disease, mad cow disease. And then a lot of psychiatric disorders, so depression, suicide, anxiety, PTSD. So many, many applications in the brain, as I say, I won't go into them in detail, because we're really here to talk about hair. Um, so the three main kinds of hair loss, androgenetic alopecia, male pattern baldness, female pattern baldness, alopecia areata, autoimmune disease, because PBM is anti-inflammatory and has been widely used in autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune thyroiditis. So many autoimmune diseases can be treated with PBM. Um, and then chemotherapy-induced alopecia. And the idea here is you probably want to start the photobiomodulation before you start the chemotherapy to uh, preconditioning the hair follicles because we know PBM induces anti-apoptotic proteins, BCL2 and survivin. And what you want to do is stop the hair follicles dying as a result of the chemotherapy. So the hair cycle in humans, I imagine the, the audience here will be well up in the hair cycle, which is 
not particularly my area of expertise, but um, you know, the idea with the photobiomodulation is it will trigger the hair follicles back into the anagen phase. So in the in the normal um, idea, when you start to get um, alopecia hair loss, the uh, hair follicles tend to be in the telogen phase and they go through the catagen into the telogen. They get stuck in the telogen phase. So if you can trigger the hair follicles back into the anagen phase, they will start to grow new hairs. And so the reason that this happens, as I said, the photobiomodulation is really quite good at activating stem cells. And in the hair follicle, you have these stem cells here, which have been stained a nice uh, fluorescent green. And they're located in the bulge region of the hair follicle. But when they're activated, they migrate down into the bulb, the dermal papilla, um, and they start to proliferate down there and synthesize new hairs. So the idea is you kickstart these hair follicles in the bulge to go down to the dermal papilla, and that coincides with the uh, transition into the anagen phase of the hair follicle. If the hair follicle is dead and you don't have any stem cells left, then the photobiomodulation is probably not going to do anything. Right? You've got to have some stem cells left in your hair follicle in order to be able to trigger them. Now, a lot of people have gone into some detail looking at markers for stem cells in the hair follicle. It's a very active area of research because a lot of stem cell biologists out there and the hair follicle is an interesting source of stem cells. So a lot of people are studying the growth factors and the signaling that happens in hair follicle stem cells. So as I said, stem cells are immortal. They take extreme care to preserve their DNA from oxidative damage. They survive in a hypoxic niche in the bone marrow or other physiological locations, such as the bulge region of the hair follicle, where they're a relatively greater distance from blood vessels. That's why it's a hypoxic niche. And because they don't have much oxygen, they have to get their energy requirements from aerobic glycolysis rather than oxidative phosphorylation. Because they want to minimize the ROS production because the stem cells are immortal. So if they're killed by oxidative stress, they're gone. So the way they change their metabolism, they have only sparse mitochondria with only a few electron transport chains. But photobiomodulation can switch the mitochondria from glycolysis towards oxidative phosphorylation. It also triggers mitochondrial biogenesis. So the mitochondria start dividing and growing within the cell. And this is one of the characteristics of stem cell differentiation as they start to grow a lot of mitochondria. And because they need more oxygen, the stem cells have to leave their hypoxic niche in search of oxygen. So this is how they're mobilized. And in the hair follicle, that means that they come out of the bulge and go down to the dermal papilla where there's a lot more blood vessels and they can get more oxygen. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but <clears throat> there is a lot of papers in the literature that photobiomodulation is beneficial for hair regrowth. Um, most of them are androgenetic alopecia in men and women. It works well in both. Some people think it works even better in women than men, but it does work in both. Um, you know, there's been controlled clinical trials, um, systematic reviews, meta-analysis. So I don't think there's any 
dispute now that photobiomodulation works well for hair regrowth. More, there's uh, 41, I think, 41 papers in the, when I did this review, which was some time ago. There's probably a lot more now. So I think it's fair to say there's an overwhelming body of literature that photobiomodulation is effective for hair regrowth. A few have looked at alopecia areata, and I think one or two have looked at chemotherapy-induced alopecia, but the vast majority have been androgenetic alopecia, probably because it's way more common than the others, and uh, people are prepared to spend money on uh, trying to get their hair back. Um, this was one paper where they actually looked at the proliferation of the human dermal papilla cells and the hair follicles with different kinds of light. They used blue light, green light, red light, and near-infrared light. Um, I think it's fair to say the red and the near-infrared work the best. The green actually worked quite well, but there is, as you can see here, a biphasic dose response. So this was in vitro. So but for red, that you needed the highest dose to get the best effect. Uh, whereas for near infrared, you know, one of the lower doses gave the best effect. But as I say, there are four different wavelengths and um, all effective. And if you look at the molecular signaling, you'll see that um, you get wind beta catenin, which is a very well known signaling pathway for stem cell differentiation and the so called ERK um, extracellular regulated kinase. So, well known molecular pathways for stimulating stem cells. Um, you know, so a lot of people have questions. Um, you know, as I say, there's overwhelming literature that it does work for androgenetic alopecia. As I say, some people think it works even better in women than in men, because women tend to have sort of um, you know, overall hair loss, not in specific parts of the head. What is the best wavelength? Um, well, the field has really settled on red and in fact red lasers so because it started off with um, Andre Nesta using a red laser people kind of stuck with it I think that you know near infrared something in the 800 nanometer rate region would work just as well and maybe even better although at present it's uh, nowhere near as well studied as red laser so basically I would think 90% of the papers have used red lasers. What is the best dose? Fluence irradiance. Um, you know, there's a, a limit to the irradiance, the power density, the milliwatts per square centimeter, or else you'll uh, heat up the skin uncomfortably. But that's quite a high limit. So, you know, 100 milliwatts per square centimeter is perfectly fine. Um, in terms of fluence, Again, I think you need a decent amount of light. So we're talking 10, 20 joules per square centimeter to get a really good effect. Um, if you spread that over the head, because the head's quite a big area, you're talking a total energy with probably at least a thousand joules of optical energy, which, which is not much actually, because a whole body light bed will give you 100,000 joules. So 1,000 joules is a relatively modest amount of total energy. Do you need a laser? Well, as I said, the field is pretty much settled on the fact you do need a laser. Um, firstly, I'd say I think there's no reason in terms of physics or biology why an LED with the same wavelength will not be effective. It may be that laser will penetrate a little deeper into the scalp, so maybe it'll reach 
down to more hair follicles, depending how deep they are. How often should the light be repeated? Um, first, I like every day, but you know, some people say every two days or every three days. Um, but you're not going to see an effect particularly quickly. You have to really, I would say, use it every day for a month to have a, a good chance of seeing an effect. Other parameters have been um, studied. Pulsing. Um, it's likely that pulsing is better than CW, everything else being equal. Um, and one, when you say pulsing, you need two parameters. So you need the uh, pulse frequency and you need the duty cycle. So 50% duty cycle is quite normal. And the pulse frequency, probably about 10 hertz is good, which is uh, 10 flashes per second. Does it work for alopecia areata? Well, all the evidence suggests it does because it's highly anti-inflammatory and this is an autoimmune disease. So you can reduce the inflammation and the hair follicles, which is what is killing the cells. Does it work for chemotherapy induced alopecia? Um, I think it should work very well if you start the photobiomodulation before the chemotherapy. So you can upregulate these anti-apoptotic and cytoprotective factors. Can it be combined with hair transplantation? I'll say a little bit about that later. And can it be combined with PRP, platelet-rich plasma, which is um, also being started to be used for hair regrowth? I think it can combine very well with that. I'll say a little bit about that. So the big question, of course, is what is the best way to deliver the light to the head? And there's a lot of devices that have been um, made by different companies to do this. Um, this is a laser comb, so they claim that they've got these teeth, so you move this around the head and it allows the light to penetrate better in the existing hair. Um, you know, there's a lot of caps. This is um, the laser cap, uh, my Graven. This is the hairband, um, another laser cap. Uh, this is a sort of fixed device. And some that had hoods. There's all sorts of devices to get the red laser light to the head. And yeah, I think something like a laser cap is probably the most user-friendly. You just put it on your head and forget about it. You don't have to worry too much about moving it around. Uh, but this was the uh, Hair Max laser comb, which we worked with a little while ago. Um, again, it works fine. The uh, sham device control double-blind multicenter trial definitely showed it worked fine, but it is a, a little tedious actually using it. Um, as I said, the majority of studies have used red wavelengths, which is uh, 630 to 670. Um, if it's a home use device, the laser has to be less than 5 milliwatts, so it uh, doesn't need laser goggles or laser safety precautions. Um, some of the devices have red lasers and LEDs in them, so they kind of mix them up inside the cap. To get a decent total power on the whole head requires a lot of laser diodes. So, you know, it could be several hundred individual laser diodes in the cap because um, they're less than five milliwatts apiece. So even that only adds up to one or two watts of optical power. Um, the cap is easier to use than a, a comb or whole head uh, fixed device. Um, you need to dissipate the heat because uh, you don't want it to get too hot and you know these devices are only 30 percent efficient so two-thirds of the energy electrical energy ends up as heat so you need to remove the heat which requires a little bit of engineering but it's perfectly manageable uh, again, this is 
Mike Raven's figure uh, showing that you probably want, if you measure it in joules per centimeter squared, you probably want about 20. Um, you know, this would be excessive. So um, it's not that everybody is the same. This is the other thing. So what is too much for one person may be not enough for another person. So it's a little tricky, but, you know, you can generally figure it out by trial and error. And most people are in the middle of the bell curve, actually. So if you say, well, 20 joules per square centimetre is probably good for most people. So when you talk about patient selection, the earlier the better. The first sign of thinning hair, remember that if your hair follicles are dead and gone, you can't resurrect them. Um, some people think that women may respond better than men because men are sort of constantly fighting against the dihydrotestosterone, the DHT, so they're not going to stop producing it. And it's kind of constantly going against their hair follicles. So um, females, DHT is not such a big deal in females. So it's possible that females may respond better than males, but it works fine in men, provided you start it early enough. Hair is a barrier to light, so you need to kind of worry about that a bit. But there again, if you've got a lot of hair, you don't need the light to get to those follicles because they're doing just fine as they are. So it's the bit where the hair's thinner that you need the light to go. So it kind of balances itself out to that, that degree. Um, skin pigmentation is important. So darker skin tones require more light, not a huge amount more. At the most, I would say double. 50% more. Um, you know, it depends how dark the skin tone is. You can combine it with minoxidil. I don't know whether it is synergistic, but you certainly can combine it. <clears throat> I say there is evidence that a small fraction of individuals may be high, hypersensitive to photobiomodulation, and another small fraction may be unresponsive. And some folks in the field are working to draw up a questionnaire to try and decide which group people will fall into. But again, I don't want to make this out to be a big deal because it's probably just a few percent at either end that are hypersensitive or totally unresponsive. So as I said, photobiomodulation combines very well with hair transplantation. It heals the donor sites, which I believe that people have problems healing the donor sites because photobiomodulation is great for wound healing. It helps the donor sites to heal. It assists in integration of the transplanted follicles into the scalp because that needs a little bit of wound healing as well for these transplanted follicles to get fully integrated. And again, it will kickstart these transplanted follicles into the anagen phase, which will get the, uh, the hair growing again quicker. Um, it's well known that light can activate platelets, so it can activate platelet-rich plasma. You can expose your platelet-rich plasma to light in vitro before you inject it into the scalp. Or you can use it. You can use the light after injection. So you can inject the PRP into the scalp, and then use the uh, the laser hair cap on the whole head, just the same as you would with uh, hair regrowth. So uh, coming to the uh, summary and conclusion here, the uh, photobiomodulation mechanisms are beginning to be understood. For many years, it was considered to be a little bit like snake oil, like alternative complementary. People didn't really believe that simple red and near infrared light could have all these cellular and biological mechanisms. But these are beginning to be understood. 
There's a lot of evidence for photobiomodulation induced hair growth. Um, I'll say there's at least 40 papers in the literature saying it works. Follicles can be rescued from dying and stimulated into antigen phase. The, uh, the wavelength, choose whether to use laser or LED, get the right irradiance, fluence and treatment repetition. But there's enough in the literature now to support these values. And it's possible that different patients may need different dosimetry. But that is not by any means certain yet. So that brings me to the end. Um, this was my lab uh, quite a few years ago now. As I say, I, I left the US a uh, year and a bit ago. So I've been back in the UK now. Um, but we did a lot of studies in photomedicine over all the years and uh, had some various funding agencies funding my research. And uh, thank you all for listening.